tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guest today will be TV host Gigi Berry and artist Roger Herman. Model, TV host, stylist Gigi Berry was born in Philadelphia and raised in Los Angeles. She went to Crescenta High School and she went to USC. I assume that because your mother is one of the top well-known casting directors, right. she had something to do with your career, which started at three. At three, it did. <laughs> um, she did and she didn't. When I was three, I started modeling. And it was crazy because I lived in Miami at the time because she was casting oh. Miami Vice. So I would do all the catalogs and commercials. I did a Jell-O Pop commercial with Bill Cosby. What, did they just see you with her? Or how did they find you? Um, I don't, I know that part I don't remember. <laughs> it was only three. But I remember my mom was very much like, if you want to do something, do it, but I'm never going to make you. And I never have booked a job that my mom cast. I'd never gone on an audition. Oh, you She's haven't? Cast. No. They don't, I don't say think it's fair. Your, um, your daughter, they do say it. But yeah. I just don't think it's very fair. Yeah. But they know that if she even says you're good, they can believe it. They can believe it. Because she knows her business. Yeah. Tell us her name. Her name is Lisa Pantone, and she's my mom, and I love her, and she's amazing. And to me, she's just mom who nags me about, you know, dry cleaning and the dogs or whatever. But to other people, they're like, oh, my gosh, Lisa Pantone. I know. She's very big. What shows has she done? She's done Miami Vice. She's cast um, tons of movies. Oh, lots of movies. A yeah. few. I can't even think, you know, how your brain gets warped. Um, commercials. Uh, we've lived here in L.A. for about 17 years, and she just works nonstop. Uh. That's great. So um, she is one of the best, we know. Yes. But what made you change your career from at 17? You were already changing careers at 17. Well, since I had been a model since I was three <laughs> and done commercials, you know, I wanted to be normal and, you know, be in high school and date boys and play sports. And I just was disinterested. And I met an amazing stylist because every time I do a commercial or work um, oh. print, I'd always be really interested in what the hair and makeup and the wardrobe, because oh. I love that stuff. Oh, so they were doing, they were making you up and they were dressing you and you didn't think of being a makeup person. No, I love clothes. It's a problem, Joan, I love clothes. <laughs> so Vivian was the perfect person, the Vivian, stylist. She was, and she was amazing and she let me go with her to shoots and just help her steam things out. My very first shoot was for Buzz Magazine with Michelle Pfeiffer and I was like bowled over and beautiful Armani, this was, I was like, this is my life. I love this. And you know? Vivian Turner, of course, was always dealing with these stars and Huge with all stars, this, yeah. <laughs> with all this great clothing. And being 17 and being around Richard Tyler or Chloe or Gucci Couture, I was like, this is unbelievable. <laughs> Just what you wanted. Just what I wanted. And then really amazing actresses like Gina Davis. And like I said, Michelle Pfeiffer, like the most beautiful woman, Selma Hayek. You know, you're just And you're blown dressing away. them? And, I was helping Vivian dress them at But this you were point. helping yes. them, yeah. I and mean, they were just amazing, lovely women, and I just loved it. It was amazing. So how long did you stay with her? Um, I stayed with Viv while I was only in high school. <laughs> oh, so you when were? I was, oh, yeah, you were just... I, was, I was a junior or senior in high school, so ah. when I could work with her, if I could get off early that day or she didn't have a shoot until the night or a weekend, ah. then I helped her. Um, and from there, after high school, I went to college for a while and decided, you know, that wasn't for me necessarily. So then I started doing a lot of commercials and independent movies on my own. You were in them. them, though. You weren't styling. Oh, no, I was styling them. Oh, you did? So I you did. went out into the styling business. I did. I went into the styling business, and it's great. Um, but when you do a commercial or a movie, it's less high-end and less couture. Like, you're shopping at Macy's and Bloomy still, but it's much more middle America or casual. But how do you uh, get the confidence in you from your clients because you have as you say you have to go to these stores and you have to borrow clothes or tell us what a stylist does a I stylist, don't want to we would Joan would say you would go well I'm doing a shoot with Scarlett Johansson like a really fabulous up-and-coming <laughs> actress and I need her to look very hot cutting-edge maybe sexy 
I take this, we'd, you know, we talk about your vision for this shoe. And then I'd go to the stores, Macy's or Bloomies or, you know, maybe a little like local designers, Yana Kay, and I'd pull a bunch of clothes. And they know you put, what's pulling clothes? Tell that means I just kind of go through the store and tear it up. <laughs> I just get tons. The more options, the better, uh, you know. And so they options, let options, you options. do this. They do let me do it. And that was the thing is I, when I started styling for myself, it was very when everything was very young in Hollywood. All the directors were 26, you know. So working with someone that's 20 isn't crazy to them. <laughs> they love it. They, and all the actresses were very, like, young and up and coming. And everything was young, 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 young. So luckily I came around just the right time. Ah. And then you designed for a while? Um, I tried to start a clothing label, but then this little show called Ambush Makeover came along and that took all my time up. Is that what happened? Um, you I did. I was in the middle of um, getting money together and designing and going to warehouses and... Instead of uh, styling. Yeah, and my old agency, Wilhelmina, called and said, Gigi. And I said, yeah, how are you guys? I haven't heard from them because I know I gave it up. And Gigi, uh, and, uh, Gigi, and Gigi is the best. And Wilhelmina is one of the top Wilhelmina modeling. Wilhelmina is one of the top modeling agencies. They've been around forever since and, Wilhelmina Cooper, who is a huge model, started it. And, and you had, were with them. And I was with them. Mm -hmm. They were not happy when I stopped. <laughs> I bet, because they were probably sending you out on a lot of calls. A lot of calls, yeah. So then how did this, um, you had a career with MTV and yes. uh, the scene. I yes. don't know what you were doing there. And Fox, the X show. What were you doing on those um, things? On all of those shows, I was. Uh, I would talk about fashion. Um, on like oh. on the X show, I would do the runway show. So I would coordinate them, put oh. the models and the stuff. So it was still doing my styling, but still I'm I'm fine on camera. Oh, so the models will come down, and I'd say, you know, Ellen is wearing this and that oh. by this and that person. And Scooby Doo, you did them. Um, yeah, uh, Scooby Doo shot in Australia when they did, all, and then they had to do all these reshoots for a good two months in LA, and I did all those because they weren't going back to Australia to do them. <laughs> Were they, was everyone nice to you? Everyone is always nice. You know, I, I love the business. It's natural to me. Now, so you said this ambush makeover came along, yes, and they ambushed you. Tell <laughs> us what that is. Um, so Wilmina called and said, there's an audition for this new Fox TV show. Oh, she called you for that? Yes, and she said, they want somebody who has an extensive knowledge of hair, makeup, and clothing, <laughs> but also can be fine on camera interviewing people and kind of... Um, being very peppy because my job is very bold. What I do on the show is we go to different cities and so someone will walk down the street and I'll look at them and I'll look into the camera and I'm like, this girl has three inch long roots and I can see her panty lines. We have to go talk to her. And I have to go up to these people I and tell them what's not working with their look. I can't believe this. And what do the people do? I haven't got slapped yet, which <laughs> is good. <laughs> I'm waiting for someone to hit me. Um, they take it in stride, but you have to remember, there's like four cameras, producers, you? PAs. You mean oh, when yeah. you're running down when the I'm street? When I'm running down the street, and I run to get the people. If I see somebody who's a real fashion victim, I go after them. So they start filming the minute you start running. So they, they get everything they on get tape. They get everything on tape. All the reactions. Yes. And some, a lot of people at first are shocked. Because I walk up, I say, hi, I'm Gigi. And they're, they see all the cameras and they're like, who is this crazy girl? And I'm like, I'm from Ambush Makeover. And I'm like, I need to talk to you about your hair because it's not working. And then they're just like, <laughs> the face changes dramatically. And then, and, and where do these uh, ambushes take place? Oh, my gosh. I've been Cities. in Mall in Manhattan. Oh, well, so I've been in New York, Atlanta, Denver, Phoenix. Literally, it's 17 states. They I've take you all over they the take country? all over the country. Well, but I mean, when you're in the Midwest, do they just freak out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> New York, L.A. New they, York, they're L.A., they're a little to. bit used to it. Yeah. Um, but in, like in Denver, <laughs> these people literally thought we were crazy just because they weren't used to seeing camera crews running at you. And then when I started the, and now it's now the show's been on for a while. The people are starting to be like, I know you. I'm scared of you. Oh, so then they have some little repartee with yes. you. Um, <laughs> is it phony? Is any of it phony? Because you look at these things and you think some of it has to be redone over and over. We we um, actually have a really strict rule on our show, which is if you don't get it the first time, you didn't get it. Is that right? That's right. And that's why, I think that's why people actually enjoy it. Well, we have, this is the problem, is that then that makes our camera crews never turn off the camera. Oh. So they're getting every moment. And then what do you do, edit it all? And then they edit it all down to like a 15-minute segment, which is 
15 hours for 15 minutes. I know, isn't it just awful? It's kind of crazy. <laughs> it's awful. But at least that you have a chance to edit once you've got yeah. these people. So then does it start looking phony? Um, it doesn't. Like, I mean, there will be things. I'm putting words in your mouth because this is what the public says. Oh, is that, that person phony? can't be real. They've they, made this up. I'm going to tell you a true story. I was in Connecticut. Um, in October, and there was a man walking by, and he looked like Santa Claus. He was a little heavier. He had a long white beard, but he had like a really, you could tell he had a really handsome face. And I talked to him the first time, and he was, no, he's like, no, I'm not this kind of person. So then I went around and talked to some other people, and then he came back around, and he said, I thought about it, and I would love to do your show. Oh. And we shaved off his beard, and people were like, he was too good of a guest to be true. He came back to me, like I wanted him in the beginning, he was a no-go, and then he came back. So, so it's you, real. So you actually filmed him saying no, Yeah. then you film him coming back and saying okay, so and it everyone does sound was like, phony. It does, but <laughs> people change their mind as you're walking back from lunch or whatever, people are like, wow, that is a good idea. I do get a Hugo Boss suit out of it, you know? <laughs> Do they get what, what you do them over in? Oh yeah, of course, and that's the least we can do because <laughs> I mean, I get paid to do this. They don't. You know, having a camera in your face for 12 hours is really an intense situation. And then do you bring them here or do you do it all in their city? We do cities? it all in their city. You do it all in their city. So that's easy for them to do the upkeep because at least like now they have a salon to go to where they can have oh, no oh, roots. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so to do good. the upkeep, to yeah. do the maintenance work. <laughs> yeah, I can only help so much. The rest is up to them. <laughs> and do you actually uh, tell them what to do? Is oh, it yeah. from your idea, your oh, it idea? Is that, yeah, that's... That's the main thing is, and I've had fights with salons, not fights, but, but disagreements, because I mean, I'll say, you know, she's blonde and I really want to take her brunette. And they're like, no, we want to take her red. And I said, no, no, I really want to take her brunette. Oh, so you're, we, the, you're the last word. I am the last word. Oh, that's really good. You have a lot of responsibility. I do. And where are you going to go from here? Are you going to sing and dance and go on Broadway? Um, if I wasn't such a horrible singer, I would say in a minute. But if I sang, wolves would come out and attack me. It's horrible. It's so bad. So what about dancing? I'm a great dancer. Oh, you could do that. I'm I just could. Wondering. I you would do everything I can. And, and where do you think you'll go from here? Um, I still love the idea of having my own clothing line, but it's a oh. lot of work, and I can't do the show and do that at the same time. Um, I'm not ruling out a career acting, but I'm not a – I'm not – a dramatic actress. Like, have I you can taken be acting lessons? No. Oh, but so. I have my mom. <laughs> Your mom can do anything. My right? mom can help me out. Oh, that's so good. So I don't know where I'm going to see you. I think I'm going to see the Gigi line, or I guess we'll watch. I'll be Fox. everywhere. We'll be everywhere. <laughs> don't come to us. That's what I was going. I don't want this woman on my show. What's she going to say to me? Cut that hair. No. <laughs> Spike it. I love style. As long as someone has a style, I love it. It's the lack of style. A lot of people have a lack of style. This is so good to say because people don't understand that. Everyone doesn't have to look rock and roll or or so well And you're put not together. telling them exactly what to do. You're just giving them an idea of how they exactly. should. Exactly. The show, after I'm done with the makeovers, there's not like a brunette Gigi, a red hair Gigi. Right. No one ends up looking like me because I have my own thing and I want them to have their own look going on. It doesn't have to be my look. It's just a look, a good put together look. And that's what you're giving people. And that's what I'm giving people. I think that's great. Thank we need you. that in America. We do. <laughs> Thanks, Gigi. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thanks for watching, Gigi. Barry. She's gotten me so excited. Um, keep watching, though, because Roger Herman, who did this painting, and we're going to show you some of his other paintings, will be our next guest. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back. I'm here with artist Roger Herman, whose work is on the set. He was born and raised in uh, Germany. And in 1975, he earned an MFA at the Academy in uh, Karlsruhe. And Roger's exhibited his work in galleries and museums all over the world. He received an art grant in Germany. And since he's been in the United States, he has two national endowments. Um, he's got excellent recognition from uh, all many, many countries. You've been in many countries, and um, you've, you've spent about the same amount of time in Germany as you have in the U.S. Um, Close, yeah. Isn't that about yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Did, did With my adult, adult life yeah. is here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did it change your painting or your ideas of painting? To be here? Oh, no, to well, paint in Germany, because you did uh -huh. get a yeah, master's there. Yeah, I was a student. There. I was yeah. a student there, and then I moved here. 
So when I came here, what happens to all art students is you, you, you kind of are in a new environment and you don't really know what to do because you start all over again. And that Do you think that made a difference? You yeah, and I've never really painted from where the environment where I'm in. I always have sort of used uh, my closed door, you know, within the studio. So I always oh. find things somewhere else in books or magazines or past oh. things. But then, so it really didn't make, doesn't make much of a difference where you are. Probably not. I mean, it's more like an internal thing. I mean, I, when I, my first paintings that I did here were paintings of my mother. They were like these 10-foot paintings of my mother where she was this giant and she was a young woman and I was not even born when I saw the picture. I mean, when the picture was I mean, when you started thinking yeah, about yeah. those? And so there were all these kind of more romantic, idealized images that I did for a, a long time. And then the only thing that I changed, maybe I, my work became a little cooler in 86, 87 when I did those buildings. But you were doing facades of buildings, yeah. which um, I, I thought was um, more geometric. I was I was thinking of like an architecture feeling in these in mm -hmm. these buildings because these these on the set were from Barcelona. Yeah, the photo was from Barcelona. You weren't actually there. I have been in Barcelona, but I mean, for me, this this image could be anywhere, you know, Germany, uh, Because it when could I be was in, in Barcelona, all, Buenos I, Aires. <laughs> all I kept seeing were Roger Hermans, uh -huh, and I was uh -huh. with my husband, I was oh, look, this is what Roger uh -huh. painted, oh, look, this is what, and so it, to me, it felt like you were there, and you uh -huh. were painting those facades, and they're so abstract. Yeah, I mean, that's what I liked uh, about it, because I always liked painting, I'm not a literary painter, I like you know, I paint images, but they're not literary. They're not about say, stories. How would you describe mm -hmm. the work? Well, the, the dilemma for me is always I'm always looking for a theme, so I never know what to paint. That is always a question. I was a, a shot, like a list, what to paint. You know, mother, uh, dog, you know, car, <laughs> Each building. time you do a show? Well, no, I mean, that's sort of my search. And then it's kind of a thing to hang a painting on. And then when I did this the first time, the story is really odd, I painted this building the first time in this slapdash manner and I said, well, that's okay, I'm probably going to paint over it. And I had it standing there and a friend came by and said, this is a great painting. <laughs> and I never thought about it to be so great. And then I figured it out and I did a few more. And then what happened is this painting is very abstract, but it's very figurative. It's a building. It has some sort of a feeling nearly like a social, uh, like a Edward Hopper feeling. It's sort of a little ghost-like. It ghost -like, does, yes, it has know, a... And it has an atmosphere. And it's flat, and it has this extreme, uh, what do you call it, a perspective. So it has, for me, all the odd discrepancies that a painting can have. That's interesting, you know? because, and, and it looks like it's black and white, and yet when you look at it, you've used so many different colors in it. Yeah, it has a lot of colors underneath it. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's an odd thing, because this painting was, in a way, a, a, a blessing. I painted it for nearly 10 years in all sizes. This is just a small version. I mean, they're 10 feet tall. And uh, the bad part about it is what, that I couldn't find a subject matter that better, was better than that for this purpose, you know, to do all of these Did things. Did you, you do them do. different? And each time you painted them, was it a different painting to no. you? Well, it was always a different painting. Yeah. But it was always the same starting point. It was the same yeah, thing the same, to you. Yeah. So you and somewhere warmer, somewhere colder, somewhere really mushy, That's somewhere what I dry, mean. you know, somewhere very soft, somewhere really hard-edged. Uh, uh, it's, it's an odd thing. I mean, it just uh, fulfilled every desire that I ever had on a painting. So were you conscious then of making them hard-edged, soft-edged? Not conscious. It just turned out like these breads, you know, like oh. these things. And I had this crazy idea at one point, I was so megalomaniac uh, that I thought every household should have one painting. <laughs> <laughs> of this. It's well, like I every chicken, every pot of chicken. I something. agree, I agree. <laughs> but what material did you use? It's just oil on canvas. Oil on canvas. Yeah. So were you waiting for it to dry and then painting different ones, or did you just paint one at I, a time? You know, I would paint, uh, I had a show at Ace at one point where I did 18. They were a very modest size, and the, the room was all these 18 paintings in all different hues and colors, and it looked a little bit like Monet's cathedral. Yes. You know, when he painted the cathedral, it was always the same cathedral of different times of the day, so the light was always different. 
And, and Ace and that, Gallery was a huge right. space. Huge space, yeah. So Your work never looks as good. It looks <laughs> great. No, it looks fabulous in that space, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So what other kind of materials did you work with? You used different materials. Uh, I, the other thing that I mainly uh, did was woodcuts. Yeah. I did these gigantic woodcuts for over, you know, 10, 20 years. So you actually carved I the carved wood? I carved it out of huge sheets of plywood, you know, images. I, I started with Van Gogh. I did these huge Van Gogh prints. I did Van Gogh shoes. I did Gauguin. Oh, you head. did? Just from his paintings? Yeah, uh-huh. And then there were these 10 by 10 foot prints. And then know. how did you do them? Did I rubbed them on the floor. I put the, the, the plates Painting on the on floor, yeah. yeah, and then you put the paper on and ink it, put the paper on and rub it with a, with a kitchen spoon. So it all because took place have a, a, in a your press. studio, yeah. on your studio yeah, floor, because yeah. it's a big, vast yeah. studio. Yeah, you just rub it by hand. It takes a few hours to rub one. Is that right? Yeah. And so those huge pieces, uh, were on paper. Do you two mm -hmm. paper pi pieces? Two or pieces one, of paper, pieces? yeah. Well, you cannot get plates bigger than nine by five feet, so that was the biggest I had. So, would we describe you as a painter? I think as yeah, a painter. Yeah, yeah, sure. As a painter. No, I'm a painter. I'm and a professor. I'm a painter and nothing, yeah, yeah and a professor. And well, a I'm professor. A, I teach at UCLA. Yeah. yeah, you teach at UCLA. Who do you teach? Well, I teach, uh, you know, painters, grad students, grad undergrads, students, yeah. both. We teach oh, you both. Do? We all do both. Yeah. Oh, you do. I mean, we, that's why probably UCLA is such a good school because this, they, the undergrads get the same faculty than the grads, and sometimes the undergrads are better than the grads because they are a little bit more innocent and open. You do know, you get to choose who comes to your graduate class? Yeah, you do. Well, you work with a selection of eight people. You know? uh -huh. I mean, we are like, I don't know, 15 faculty for about 40 students. And so you have great artists working yeah, there. Yeah. Usually, yeah, Bidasari and Chris Burden and Charlie Ray. Yeah, it's a great school. Usually, schools don't have that kind of faculty. No. So UCLA is no, really we the, way ahead, yeah, aren't yeah. they? Well, it's a little bit styled after a German model, where you have these top teachers who are, have a professional life, and then they teach. You, know, that's you, you have done, we talked about the series of different things you've done. So I, I was thinking you've done Rouen, you've done Saint-Victoire, you've done buildings that mm -hmm. are familiar to people. But you're telling me that you don't actually go to those places. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a disappointment. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I was always sort of an art buff from when I was a kid, so I, I know a lot about art, and I always wanted to make art that is already art. So it was a little bit, oh, so you know. That yeah, was a I mean, I used to do play? little ships and set them on fire and take photographs when I was like seven years old. You know, just sort of to toy around with images that would look like a Turner painting or something like that. So you, you were know? really aware of that. Well, I'm always aware of what is kind of a, a bad thing. Sometimes it's very European that you are so loaded with history that you use that history. You know, you, you don't have that freshness of starting always new. You always use what you already have in the bag. Right. So all you're doing is researching all the time. You're using Recycle. what's in the back. Recycle. Recycle. Yeah. But you're also researching and looking for things in your mind. Yeah. I mean, for when I did th these very, always, yeah. When I did these huge paintings, these very big abstracts, these like, f I did like some 12 by 40 foot paintings. I looked at old Gothic paintings. You 12 know? by 40? Yeah. Where yeah. did somebody put a painting like that? I mostly showed them. I mean, I showed them at, at Ace, Ace I showed them at the County Museum, I showed them in La Jolla. I showed them, you know, and some so people bought them. So they're 12 feet tall and 40 feet long? Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, they were, were they, how many pieces were they? There were seven pieces in one uh, painting. They came in panels, you know, yeah. but you, you don't see. They're kind of seamless. They are, oh, that's know. so great. But I looked at Uccello and people like that who did these kind of really manic puzzle paintings. You yeah. know, and then I would do them, put them. So I would look at other art to make new art. It was always like collaging out of other people. And, and this piece behind us? Oh, this is, a, uh, this is also a small piece. Right now I'm painting these pl the big plants these jungles. So they are like, uh, and this is just a small uh, sketch. Are these at your I don't studio? Know if you can see is it. this at your studio? Yeah. Uh -huh. Is it? Yeah. So this plant is there. You've actually yeah. found a plant, a plant that you're that actually I mean, using. Uh, like an ugly cactus, yeah. Yeah. Or like an agave. And I did, uh, I have a show at uh, Gallery C with uh, Jimmy Hayward and Hubert Schmalix and um, uh, Peter Lodado. Gallery C is it's a, a It's old a big space down in Hermosa Beach. But it's a theater. It yeah. was the old it Bijou was a theater. Movie theater. But it got a total makeover and it's a great space. It's so they gutted, space. The, gutted yeah. the movie theater and then they put in what panels for you? Yeah, well, we, no, it's, it's like a big, regular big space. It, it's as nice as a Gagosian gallery nearly, but it has uh, what, we, what was interesting to show with these two abstract painters and two figure 
decorative painters. Uh, that's where I show those your jungle work paintings. Goes, it, it, it goes, goes both. both ways, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? Well, I always think it's both ways. I mean, you cannot never be an abstract painter. Exclude. I mean, you know. I, I don't know how to say it. Every painting is abstract for me, even if there's a yeah, big figure on it. You know. Even with the figure, yeah, yeah because I I've mean, seen those figuratives yeah. that look abstract until you see, and then all of a sudden it becomes so figurative yeah. I mean, that you the, can't the, realize the it. The best part about a Matisse is that it's the abstraction of it, how, how you know, yeah, even corn. what's there, what is it? was always there? a big model for me, and yeah. he went both ways. I see, I see. That, <laughs> that's really good. Both but ways. then the other thing, yeah, the other thing is this uh, Chinatown. Uh huh. Re rebirth. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm involved in this one space called the Black Dragon Society, and it is a space that we got about six years ago, five years ago. And first it was just a space that looked beautiful, and we thought, you know, like you get a beautiful piece of furniture, a beautiful vase, was having this space. <laughs> so me and two other people, uh, <coughs> Hubert Schmalix and a, and a filmmaker, uh, we rented it, and we put up work, stuff that we owned. Your own. And or friends, and then we, we were never open. And then I gave my students the keys to do shows, and that's how it started. Oh, so because it has young contemporary or yeah, young yeah. new painters coming Mostly, in. Mostly, yeah. And so we, <coughs> we had these shows, but we didn't have a phone. We didn't have an address, really. We didn't have an opening. We never were open. Uh -huh. But oddly enough, we got all this press. You know, it became this hot thing. And it was uh, well, and I you've mean, also uh, people from New York have come and seen yeah. the painters and oh, yeah, taken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Charlie Coles had uh, one of your painters back there. I don't it's think Charlie Coles. I think more the, the younger uh, galleries the, are picking on us. He has a now. younger gallery Does inside his gallery, oh, I and I think that. they've come and looked around. Dennis. I know that Corcoran came by. Yeah, yeah, Jim came. Yeah. And, and, yeah, so it's it's like the place. Oh, it's to the go. hot place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really odd. I mean, I didn't. I, I mean, I don't want to wear so many hats. You Did know? you put your cactus paintings up there? No. Oh, I did one show, not with the cactus, but with these big poppies. Yeah, big oh, poppies. Oh, 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 yeah. poppies. That's But it's an good. odd thing to show <laughs> in your own space. So mostly we show other people, you know, a lot of young artists who are really good and really, they're really, it's interesting because these young and new kids are really in love with painting and they're not like the bad boy artists like 10 years ago. They <coughs> really, it's kind of a resurrection with surrealism, but it's really odd. I never liked surrealism, but this is interesting because it's so... So it's very flat it's, and bizarre? It's very bizarre and very uh, psychosomatic. Really? Yeah, I mean, sick drawings, really. Well, we're going to have to keep <laughs> you. Come we're we're going to put you in <laughs> at the Chinatown Gallery, close the door, and see how you come out. Yeah. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Thank you for watching our show, and we thank Roger Herman for loaning us his work for uh, the last couple of shows we've done. And keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 917, and we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Thank you.